Hi, my name is Rachel Mason, and I'm the director, writer, and producer of Circus of Books. I'm also an indie artist and musician, and I'm excited to discuss the film Circus of Books on words and music. Next, join me. Welcome to this episode of Words and Music, and we have a real exciting guest on the show today. I speak to Rachel Mason, an indie music artist who found success with filmmaking with a current project on Netflix called Circus of Books. So here is my conversation with Rachel. We are actually promoters, you know, we um, promote music tours. Oh. Comedy tours, and in 2016, we, you know, the RuPaul Drag Race was going to Australia, and um, our whole thing, uh, Rachel, is concert promotion. So you know what? I actually have a my 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 life before Circus of Books was in the indie music world. I'm a musician too, so that's cool to know because I always have one foot in that world and one foot in this world as well. So that's great. Yeah, the Circus of Books right now, the movie is eligible for an Emmy nomination. So, yeah. And also, it's going to be eligible for an Oscar nomination, too. So that's really huge. Yeah. So the more we can promote and get people excited about it in the next few months, the better. Yeah. When we first saw this documentary, um, what attracted to me was when I saw Alaska. And I said, like, that was my connection. I didn't know what Circus of Books was I mean you, you can imagine us being here in Singapore so how would we know and gay and porno you know it was impossible you know for us to you know have that connection but Alaska you know the, the trailer I told my husband Ross it's in Hollywood you know let's watch this uh, documentary I watched it the second time because it was the story of an unassuming mom and pop building this empire which I found had a parallel to me and my husband. We connected with your parents because when at the time when our son was born, we said, like, what are we going to do? Wow. And we started our concert. We started LAMC Productions, which is concert promotion. We had no clue, Rachel, how we were going to do it. I didn't have it. I mean, I didn't have any experience promoting concerts, but we jumped right in. So I felt a real deep connection just watching your documentary you know, telling your story of your parents. So, wow. and that's why immediately when I saw it, I said, I have a connection with, with your family in the way, the, the way you told your story. And I was so excited to jump on the call and, you know, find and reach out to you. Well, you know, it's really interesting because I think there's something universal in my parents' story, which is, you know, exactly that. It's like the scrambling to figure out a way to make a living. And you also, this idea that it's unpredictable how life will lead you where it leads you and that you really might be accidentally doing this thing all the way over here. And in some ways, I think my documentary is like that for me. I set out to be an artist and I was very clear in that. I had always just nothing but clarity on being an artist and, you know, being a songwriter and musician and performing. And yet that was never a path towards making a living, making an income for me, no matter how hard I try. You know, I think the way that I make music is just an, an art. It's more esoteric. It has sort of like a cult following. But, um, you know, I think I never understood the business side of things. And then when I made this documentary, this was my first like business success. And now I'm in the world of filmmaking and I'm having the most incredible opportunities meeting people who want to work with me on my next project so I'm realizing like wow I feel like I'm kind of like my parents you know stumbling into porn like I've stumbled into documentaries I, I love making them I, I feel like this is where I belong right now so I think a lot of people you know stumble into where they 
land. And then it's, it's a matter of, you know, well, am I going to do this with passion and do a great job, you know? Definitely. So how did the process start for you to make this documentary? So, you know, a number of years ago, I actually I went to Yale University and I took a, uh, a gay and lesbian studies class at the time it was called that. And it was really interesting because I mentioned to my professor, you know, that my parents owned this store in Los Angeles and I didn't think it was going to make it that much of a difference to him. I thought he might say, oh, that's cute, something like that. But he instead said, wow, Rachel, you know, the Circus of Books is one of the most important gay stores in the entire world. And these kinds of bookstores are like the backbone of our historical legacy because we were not allowed to have anything that would be mainstream, you know, for so many generations there was no gay historical record. It exists in the underground. So he really kind of gave me this mandate. He said, I hope you do something with this. And, you know, you really should do something with this whole story. And at the time, I didn't know what I was going to do because I, I set out to be an artist. You know, if anything, I'm more like Alaska than I am, you know, a filmmaker. I, I like to perform. I like to be on a stage. I like to have lines. I like to be in character. I am a performer um, in, in that sense, and I really kind of shifted gears, and I said, okay, I'm going to put my music ambitions and my projects that I'm doing in the art world on hold, and I'm just going to focus on making this documentary as good as I can, and so that's what led me to make it when I found out the stores were going to close. And what year was that, that you decided to make this documentary? That was 2014. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I know it's hard to believe it's almost five years since I really started working on it. And and how did this come into fruition? You know, you started working on it, you know, how did the process go? Because I saw in 2018, um, the documentary was, um, there was a screening of it at Circus of Books, right? Yeah, we screened a little short excerpt of it in the store. Um, and it was actually sort of like a little event because, sorry, the city of West Hollywood invited my parents to um, be the recipient of a award. And it was called um, the July 15th is now officially the Circus of Books Day in the city of West Hollywood. So they issued an ordinance and it was a really cool, um, you know, special thing. And so we figured we would do an event at the store and we did this beautiful little event at the store. And I showed some of the film, but the film was really completed in 2019, and then it was released in 2020. How did you raise the capital to make this documentary? It was very hard. You know, for the first couple, well, the first year, I got really what's, you know, an amazing angel donor named Jerry Herman, who, who came on very early as my executive producer. And, you know, I think when you're a filmmaker, you have a special place in your heart always for the rest of your life to those people that before anyone else came in, gave you a little money. And that's what Jerry did. He said, okay, I will give you a little money to help you start this project. And then I also asked my parents for some money too. And, you know, so I basically got a little bit of money just to get the whole project going. And then I started production and I had a really great, um, producer joined me. Her name is Cynthia Childs. And she came out of the world of reality TV. So she knew everything about staging interviews and setting things up and properly getting things, you know, logged in terms of footage. So we really had a great team right off the bat. And then about a year into it, I needed to raise money for an edit. And that proved to be very, very, very difficult. So we created a sizzle. It's called a, you know, a, a sizzle reel showing the, the, the bit that we had basically created. And I worked very hard having meetings and meetings and meetings with lots of different people, many of whom just said, well, you know, this seems like it would be a great project, but I don't really see any commercial appeal, you know? And, and yeah, now that we've seen the widespread commercial appeal of circus of books, um, it all sounds very funny, but at the time people didn't see it. You know, they said, this is like a, you know, gay porn is a very 
unlikely thing to get, you know, a lot of traction in the mainstream. It's probably going to be a film that gets into the sort of academic circuit and maybe, you know, the gay film festival world. So, you know, it was very demoralizing. But if anything, I learned that you have to really just keep going and keep powering through. And, you know, every single step is, is going to lead somewhere. So eventually, um, you know, I got financing from another person who supports women filmmakers and her name is Rhiannon Jones. And she became my next like angel investor. And really it was just this amazing set of financing with Rhiannon and Jerry and then me in the end putting some of my own money into it and it was just like that's how it got made there really were not a lot of people putting money into it and at the very end when the film was completed and we had an actual cut of the film I had a sales agent at that point who showed the film to Ryan Murphy and Ryan really fell in love with it and said you know I would totally put my name on as an executive producer and help you to make a sale to Netflix. So that's how we got a really great sale in the end. But the film was made for so much less than most people think, um, because I really didn't have a lot of financing to make it. Did you feel that you were, you know, just having Ryan, you know, Murphy just come on board that just did it for you? Yeah, I felt vindicated in the end. I felt this sense of like, Wow, you know, everybody said that we couldn't do it. I mean, I had my my editor always believed in the project. So I have this great editor, Catherine Robson. And you know, and she's also a producer and she's also a um a writer on the film. And and I remember we would have meetings and I would take Catherine to all of these meetings and she would hear people say, you know, this doesn't have commercial appeal and and Catherine would just come out of the meetings and say to me, Rachel, they are wrong. I'm telling you, I worked at a production company. I see it. I know that they're wrong. And, I, you know, I was feeling very, well, I don't know this industry that well. And I guess you know better than me. So in a way, Catherine constantly telling me that she could, she believed in it was something that helped me have that faith. Why did you feel it was important for you to tell your parents' story? You know, just, I mean, just if... I mean, just take away the Yale University uh, professor, but for you, as in, why did you feel that it was important for you to make this documentary? So, you know, I think in a way, now that it's been out and I've seen the, the actual family side be the most powerful part of the film, you know, I had two things. For me, I was always in the, in the queer space. I, you know, being an artist, my my heroes are like the Alaskas or Frida Kahlo or, you know, artists really often are, are without even maybe deciding to do this, often are at the head of their time in terms of gender and sexuality. And, and those are the people that always I was in love with. And so in a way, I, I never thought too much when I was in high school about my brother Josh and the fact that he could actually be a a gay man struggling to come out of the closet when I was already feeling like, wow, I found my people. I found my space. You know, I love gay culture. I feel gay myself. I mean, I am bisexual, so I never felt gay a hundred percent, but I always felt like I don't exist in the same space as the people around me. So I just, for me, it wasn't a sense of, um, you know, I, when, when I made the film, part of what I had to say is that going into my family story, and seeing how healing that journey was for the for many people in the world, now I feel like the film had to be made really for almost for that healing message to get out there. Because I just think that what my mom was able to express and what we were able to create by showing how she was able to overcome her own homophobia, I think really um, is a very powerful thing for the world that we live in and it's still a very religious world with people like my mom who are you know really unable to process how to just get through this sort of religious and cultural problem they have she has this issue being you know religious but still she you know went on and you know did all this i would say incredible films also not just the bookstore but you know after the bookstore became, you know, the films, right? The development of the films. 
I think that's the real amazing thing. And I think the way she compartmentalized it was that she didn't like it. She was not um, in any way proud of it, but she knew that this is the money that would help support her family. It was, a, it was to make a living. It was to support her kids. And I think my brother says it, says it best that, you know, um, it was like a dividing line in my mom's head between the family and that everything, you know, in regard to the business was in support of the family, ironically. And I think it's so great that he uses the word ironic because the Christian right in America, at least in many other places in the world, they say that gayness, gay culture, pornography is on the opposite side of family values. And here you can look at my mother being completely in the world of family values as her center of everything. And family values align with running this business. She was able to do it. And, and her family values were never for a minute at stake. Did other children with parents running family business connect with you after the documentary? You know, it's interesting that you say that. Yes, after I put the film out, I've had a few interesting emails from people that said very similar things that were like, wow, you know, I always knew that my uncle was in this business, but he never told anybody. And, you know, it was sort of like the family secret or, you know, it was a kind of a thing that everybody was a little bit ashamed of in my family. And, you know, people really who are in the industry wrote to me some very beautiful and powerful messages that I, I have to say have been very um, poignant for me to read. What's your parents' reaction after seeing the documentary? Well, my dad is the same person he is in the film. So nothing ever makes him upset. And, you know, he said that he, he there was some footage that we shot that he wished it was in. And I remember we shot some overhead um, shots of my dad riding around his uh, motorcycle that were kind of funny. And, you know, there's things about the film that I just, you know, he, he just loves all of it. He thinks it's great. And my mom, on the other hand, says I she thinks I did a good job, but she wishes it was about anybody else except her. I think she's the one person in Los Angeles that doesn't want to be famous. <laughs> and it's funny. I think it's, um, I just think that she grew into the space of just wanting to, you know, her number one priority in the entire world is family. And she loves the, her business. And that business is also like a family. You know, all the people that sh that worked for her, she cared a lot about. I mean, really, it was like a second family. And how about, you know, because your, your mother wanted to keep it under wraps, right? So now that the film came out, did your parents get reaction from family and friends? And, you know, what was that like for her? You know, I think they've all gotten a lot of interesting reactions. And I mean, it's been very positive. I, you know, I, I think that's been a shock because my mom, even from my grandmother, who's actually very, very conservative, you know, um, it's been a shock that everybody has not been judgmental. My mom was always expecting the worst. And I think, you know, a, a beautiful thing about what I feel is that in a way I was able to expose my parents and my mom for what they did right in the world. And I, I always felt like what they were doing was amazing. And, you know, I'm somebody that understands gay culture and understands how marginalized it has been for so many years and, and how the struggle has been so painful. I mean, it has not been easy. It has been a really very repressed, painful, you know, historical record. And, including and especially what happened during the AIDS period. And my parents were so a big part of that. And, you know, I just feel like that is part of my motivation for making this film. You know, it's, it is the sad, painful reality of gay culture. You know, yes, we hear about all the great, beautiful, amazing things, but, but a generation was completely wiped out. And not only were they wiped out, they were shamed while they were um, they were in the worst sickness you could imagine. I mean, the type of disease that they had is just the same as COVID. So it's really weird. It's like strange to have a, a pandemic happen when my film is being released because this is what the gay community suffered. They suffered a pandemic, but worse than that, 
they suffered it under a cloud of shame. And this film is dedicated to their memory. Circus of Books is actually able to be nominated for an Emmy Award. And this is the weekend. On Monday, they decide. So, you know, I think... Oh, wow. Rachel, that's why I wanted to connect with you. You know, I, I, I saw this as a very important um, documentary you made. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm in Singapore. So we definitely want to get, you know, you know, even though people, you know, people say, oh, it's niche, it's niche. I don't care if it's niche. I, I, um, I was attracted to it. You did a beautiful storytelling and I'm, you know, we're going to definitely get the word out there for you. Well, I appreciate it because, you know, I'm sure you're connected to people with high profiles. And at this moment, you know, I really think one of the things that has been powerful to me and I've recognized it now on Netflix, God, it's going to make me cry, but it's, I get emails from people in parts of the world, and I really don't know about Singapore, but where it's just not okay to be gay. I mean, Malaysia, I've gotten emails from people in Malaysia, and I mean, I cannot believe it because I grew, I mean, I've always been in a gay, safe place, but you know, I'm Jewish, so I can understand, wow, you know, when it was not okay to be Jewish in Nazi Germany, how fucking scary is that? So, you know, my heart just breaks for all people in this world that really cannot be gay and, and, and their government cannot accept them because it is so painful. And, you know, if this film is able to be seen by people on Netflix, I mean, that's just something I feel very proud of because it's also about the importance of sex and not shaming it. And I think gay people have such a hard time with that. And it's a very painful subject, especially in places in the world where you just cannot be, it's not safe to be gay. So, you know, I really have to say, if there's something special about Circus of Books, it's that it combines a story of a sex positive message with a family story with a gay message and you know and also a message about religion and and it's at the center of everything that is our conflict as gay people to overcome is how do we convince those people like my mother who needed to be convinced that she could completely accept her gay son and i think that's what you know if the film wins awards if it gets nominated i think it will elevate this loud message that is really important so how are your two brothers yeah they're really great my brother my younger brother who who you know he's the one that the story centers around he's been so i think very moved by the reaction because people now write to him from all over the world and tell him that they see themselves in his story you know and i think there's this very powerful um, concept of this idea of like the best little boy in the world. And Josh, it's a, it's sort of a, it was a book that was written, I think a, a long time ago about what a lot of gay men specifically struggle with, which is this, um, it's, it's like a, a state of being. They're trying to be such a good person and so perfect because they have this deep shameful thing which is their homosexuality buried inside of them. So a lot of gay men are such perfectionists. They're so extreme in being perfectionists. And it's because, you know, they feel very much shame about this deep, dark secret. So people have written and said, you know, wow, your brother's just like me. You know, I always wanted to be the best little gay boy or the best little boy in the world. And I just, you know, it's a very sad idea, a concept that like you have to be perfect if you are gay because, you know, something is wrong with you deep down. And of course, I feel nothing <laughs> is true about that. I think it's so sad that people feel that way. But that's exactly what was Josh's situation. I think he was really trying to be the perfect little boy that, you know, my mother would always love. And of course, she would love him anyway. But, you know, I think it's a it's the cross that a lot of people bear who are gay. Well, thanks for sharing that, um, Rachel. So July 15 is Circus of Book, the Circus of Books Day, right? So what is it like? How's the day celebrated in uh, West Hollywood? 
actually, now that you mention it, I don't know that there is a celebration happening, but, but I just, cause I don't think it was a very big point that got made. And I think I will go ahead and um, tell the city of West Hollywood, cause I have to remind them that July 15th is the circus of books day in the city of West Hollywood. But you know, it was just sort of like an ordinance that was issued. And I think it's a fun little fact. So, you know, that was something that, uh, that I think we, you know, and it's a local lore, I suppose to say. So, you know, like after watching the, the documentary, I, I said to myself, wow, you know, with all the history um, attached to the Circus of Books, plans for franchising this? What plans, Rachel? I mean, since you've already done, you know, this great documentary, what's next for Circus of Books? I'm sure, what are your plans? It's so interesting that you say that because I, you know, I have other stories that feel very easily like the sequel or the part two, because there's so many other narratives that spun out. And I wish I could have included them all in this film, but I couldn't, of course. And so, you know, there's definitely um, I'm having talks with different producers about potentially expanding the stories of, you know, some of the amazing gay porn people and and writing it into a story um that is a you know a, a really cool part two in a way and then the next thing is that um ryan murphy actually has optioned it to be a fictional series so you know that's really exciting it, that it could really be a a fictional tv series nice like like hollywood exactly oh my god yeah. i loved that oh, yeah Wow, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that. And then I, I read that you are signed now to UTA. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> oh my and God, it, yeah. yeah. So happy for you. Thank you. It's really been an amazing t time because, you know, they've introduced me to so many people and I, I really do have other projects that are coming up that now because I'm signed to UTA, I just have this wonderful set of agents working with me and um you know I, I i'm really excited about um you know i've had meetings with so many great production companies like some of the top producers in the world and so you know i i know for for now for certain that i'm going to be able to have a very real career in this field and then the financing also right so the financing yeah. will be in place well well you know Often you, you have meetings that lead to other meetings. So you might have a meeting with one company that then they seek out the financing. But because people now trust me as a director, I can be attached to a film and as a selling point. So that's one of the things that's really exciting is that, you know, I'm now able to be attached to projects and people are interested in seeing what I have next. Okay, so we are going to, you know, do our, our part, uh, get the machine going. I'll reach out to some, you know, of the LGBT queens we've worked with. We we had Bianca Del Rio. I was so fascinated with Bianca and I said, oh my God, she's such a comedy queen. This was back in 2017. And I brought her out to Singapore and Hong Kong. Singapore, we sold out a thousand seat capacity. And Hong Kong, we sold 600 tickets. And then we brought her back again uh, in 2019. And we, we, we went into a new market. So we promoted her Manila. We did two shows. I miss doing the tours, you know. You know, it's so interesting. I was actually in Hong Kong with my first film because the first thing that I made was the exact opposite of this kind of film. It was a musical film where I performed all of the music and I wrote all these songs. And it's entirely musical. It's called The Lives of Hamilton Fish. And I applied it to film festivals all over the world. It's a very obscure film. And the one film festival that accepted it and flew me out was in Hong Kong. And it was an amazing experience. And I, it was my first time in Asia and only time in Asia. But I, I fell in love with, you know, the culture there and just that I saw almost like a little glimpse into it. And I just realized, wow, you know, our world is so interesting. Like I never would have thought, you know, um, that people in Hong Kong or Asia would totally understand what I was doing here in the U S and especially my first film was so obscure. So I, I, I really can't wait to be back myself and I would love to, you know, connect. And actually my uh, partner, my lover is a transgender man himself. 
And um, his name is Buck Angel. I don't know if that name is familiar to you. But so, yeah, you can look him up. But he's friends with everybody in the RuPaul's Drag Race scene. And so, yeah, I, I would be so grateful if you told them, you know, that it would mean a lot to me to promote, you know, to tweet about Circus of Books anytime because we really uh, could use the support. So, Okay, I will. I'll reach out to um, Margaret Cho as well. Oh, she already tweeted yeah. about it. Yeah. Margaret has been one of my biggest supporters. Yeah. And Buck is friends with her, right? Okay, my love. Good. Yeah, wow. but so. Such no, a small I, world, yeah. Yeah, no, but I, I figure you must know all these people. And Alaska has been so supportive, too. And, you know, in a way, Alaska steals the show. But Alaska really was a, a clerk at the store. And it was just amazing that, you know, that was his job, Justin, you know, and his, when he's not out of. He's out of drag, so. Well, thank you so much, and I really appreciate it, and, and we'll be in touch, hopefully. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Well, there you have it, my conversation with Rachel Mason, the actor, director, producer, and scriptwriter for Circus of Books. We wish Rachel all the best in her nominations at the Emmys and the Oscars, and we look forward to more great work from her. If you enjoyed this show, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us at LAMC Productions on our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Until next time, my name is Loretta Alabans for Words and Music. Goodbye.